pleasure to, to introduce, as I think the last lecturer of the day, my good friend Diego Mendez Rosito, who is director of the Skull Base program in Mexico City, and hopefully is going to bring it all together as he is going to talk about 360 degree approaches to the middle fossa. Diego, my good friend, it's all yours. If you would like to share your screen, yeah. Unmute your microphone and and talk to us. Perfect. Thank you very much, Professor Jack Morcos. For me, it's a real honor to be sharing here. The the being uh, in Egypt, this uh, this uh, modern way that it's uh, through through these uh, lectures. Um, it's a great honor to to have shared uh, the podium with uh, great professors. Um, we have learned great things from Pro Professor Kono, from that it's really late in Japan, from Professor Liu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goel, Goel for all the, the experiences shared. I completely agree with what you said that Professor Victor Hugo Perez, it's a great, a magnificent anatomical, uh, uh, great anatomical professor from cranial and also from uh, uh, medullary anatomy. Uh, Professor Benes, I am really grateful with uh, the, the, what you mentioned about uh, analyzing the patient and, and about understanding and, and waiting and, under, and having the maturity of, 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 of deciding these, this, this, uh, this, uh, with these cases. Today, I would like to talk about unlocking the middle fossa, which is like a, a, a concept. I'm, I highly uh, more share that the middle fossa, not as, a, not as a, a, a region of tumors, but it's a corridor. So I think that the concept of the middle fossa, it should be approached as a corridor, not only the, anat and the anatomical region, but only all the corridors that the previous professors have shown that you can reach the anterior fossa, you can reach the, the tuberculum cell, the clinal region, the, also the posterior fossa, combining it. And it's a very versatile corridor that you can combine, combine it with posterior fossa approaches. So at the end, for me, this middle fossa is like the center of the universe because it's so versatile that you can combine it with many things and you can do great uh, extradural work in order to approach the, 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 to approach the, the different types of tumors. How do we do it? We generally use it as a regular trional approach. We do a trional approach as, as, as we have all learned and the regular Trional craniotomy. And where is the, the goal point? Where is the most important point for us? Is over here. What Professor Bennis mentioned earlier, the meningo orbital band. This meningo orbital band, it's of great value because when you ever section sharply the band, this band, you can open and expose the anterior clinal process. This is going to be really is gonna facilitate that we can complete the peeling of the middle fossa. And so this is going to what we called unlock the middle fossa, the UTMF approach where we unlock the middle fossa. And this is gonna allow us to do a complete peeling as we have seen in other cases, this anatomical case where we are doing the complete dissection and peeling of the middle fossa in order to expose the complete uh, skull base. Obviously, we don't do this in all the approaches. Obviously, it's a stepwise approach in order that if you start with the meningo orbital band, you can expose easily the, tuberc the orbital region, the planum, the tuberculum cella. You can expose the clinoral region. You can go to the, the to the cavernous sinus. You can go to the trans cavernous sinus or trans Meckel's cave region. You can go to anterior petrosal region. And also we can go to the infratemporal fossa. So using this middle fossa as a concept, it is a great uh, thing that you can use it in all these different corridors.
So I find it really useful. Obviously, you're not gonna do it for every case. There's some cases where you only use the phase one in other cases where you use the phase two and do a peeling of the middle fossa, a phase three where we go to the posterior fossa or in some other cases where you go uh, to like what we call phase four and go to the in infratemporal fossa. And so we're gonna show a few cases of the concepts used in this region. For example, going to pathology in the orbital region, it's very, very, some cases that not necessarily I'm sorry, not necessarily invade inside the orbit, but this, uh, like in this meningioma, it's going to produce uh, uh, a proptosis due to the uh, uh, enlarged sphenoid wing. And so what do we do? Like this patient that she was, um, she had three prior surgeries. And these cases, usually what we do is do only phase one, where we unlock the middle fossa by opening the orbitomeningeal uh, orbitomeningeal membrane in order to expose and do all the drilling and uh, removing and, and decompressing the optic nerve. And as you can see this in this case, we the patient now doesn't have any proptosis. For example, in this other small case, it was important because the patient was acutely uh, losing her vision uh, because it was a, a pregnancy-induced tumor. So it was kind of, 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 uh, of uh, complex in, in the decision-making because of the baby. And what we do in these cases is that we do uh, peeling. We start with the frontal, then we expose into the, uh, up to the point where we see the, the orbitary fissure. We start doing the peeling uh, we start doing the drilling, I'm sorry, of the, of the lesser wing. We expose routinely the orbit. And as we can see here, we can see the orbitomeningeal membrane, which is sectioned. Here, the superior orbitary fissure is exposed. And in here, the anterior clinoid process is completely exposed. This patient, she was, she was as you saw, uh, she had an a acute... Uh, rapidly progressive uh, visual impairment. And so what we did is we decompress the optic nerve. And then after we decompress extradurally the optic nerve, what we do is that we go intradurally and then it's uh, as a regular tumor where the tumor was already devascularized because we went in, in we're going to devascularize it as, in, as it is shown here going extradurally, and we are going to, op to open the falciform ligament in order to decompress extradurally and intradurally the nerve. And then, as you can see, we are devascularizing the tumor in the tuberculum cell. I'm going to go a little faster. And as you can see, the tumor is already, already devascularized. So it's, it's just like a regular tuberculum tumor where we complete the removal. It is very important to be very cautious with the contralateral optic nerve and the pituitary stock in order to have a complete tumor. And this is the result. And she recovered her vision and the baby was did, did good. This is another type of tumor where uh, tuberculum, where these are more invasive because of the venous, because of the arterial encasement and the edema that these tumors have. And it's very important to, uh, sorry, uh, to complete uh, and do as much as you can do extradurally to devascularize these tumors. Some other tumors, for example, in the in the in the like this one, this in the clinoidal region, you can see that this tumor is developing from the, the dorsal part of the clinoid. I'm sorry the dorsal part of the clinoid. And as you can see here, we do the same approach. We devascular, we, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we open the orbit, we section the orbitomeningeal membrane. Why is this? Because the tumor is going to be originating from the clinoidal region. So we have to debulk this anatomy, this, uh, this uh, clinoidal, process, and it's very important to understand these tumors anatomically. 
We have to understand that we have the relationships of the anterior clinal process with the optic nerve, the carotid, and the oculomotor nerve. And we have to understand the origin of these tumors. This origin is going to allow us to understand the, the arachnoidal dissection of, of, of the tumors. As well, it's very important to understand the bony attachments of the anterior clinal process. It's going to have three attachments, one to the lesser wing, one to the optic, uh, optic canal, optic roof, and another one to the optic strut. So whenever we are in surgery, we have to analyze this and always remember, as in this case, that we are seeing that we have mucosa here. So I, as I search, I see that we have an anterior clinal process that is, that is um, uh, pneumatized. And so what we do is only devascularize the tumor, and then we can go and open the, the sylvian fissure, as we are doing here. And as you can see, now this tumor, it's, it's uh, deva completely devascularized. And we can see that here we have the left, the right uh, optic nerve. We have the chiasm here. And as I was mentioning earlier, the arachnoidal dissection, it's so important in order to have uh, all the peripheral the, the dissection and exposure. And whenever this is uh, assured, now we can deliver the, the tumor since in this case, it was, it was possible due to the arachnoidal attachments. Now we can see the internal carotid artery, A1, and we have a complete uh, removal and dissection of the tumor. And this was because we devascularized the tumor uh, from its origin. And this is the post-op and this is the patient. Other tumors similar to this where we have a lot of edema, it's very important to attack at first the anterior clinal process in order to devascularize these tumors. Some other tumors, for example, are required in order to go to the posterior to that are invading several compartments. Like in this case, for example, uh, this was a, pa a patient with this steno uh, meningo orbital uh, meningo steno. I'm sorry, the it's completing in the. Oh, I'm sorry, this the computer here, and we do the com we com complete the, we do the same routine basis where we, uh, superior orbital fissure is exposed, the orbit is exposed, the, the um, meningo orbital band is opened. And now here we are, we are devascularizing the tumor because we are attacking and we are doing the peeling. And previously we sectioned the, the, the meningeal artery. And as we can see, we can always come back to the anatomy and think about the anatomy. And in this case, I know that I did a peeling and this is going to be my exposure of B1, B2, and B3. At this moment, we can open part and we can see how fibrous this tumor is in, in going into Parkinson's triangle. And we can continue in order to debulk. We know that these tumors are not going to be removed in a, in a in 100%, but we want to debulk them as she had a, 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 a sixth cranial nerve. And so we want to debulk them in order to later on send, uh, uh, observe, and if it grows, send to radiosurgery. At this moment, we are opening uh, and exposing the devascularized tumor. as we can see here, and it's very important to go all the way back to, uh, to the free edge of the tentorium in order to show the, uh, the healthy part of the tumor at this part. And so here in the back, we're going to see the, the part of the, of the tentorium, which is now exposed that it's free of tumor, and we remove the complete part in order to, to, to expose here the pons and the petroclival region and expose the devascularized tumor, as it is shown here. Here we try to, to clean up as much as we can 
And we know that this is going to be uh, an incomplete removal. I'm sorry. Yeah. But now we can send it to, to radio surgery in case this tumor grows. This same approach can be done like it was previously shown for trigeminal schwannomas, that it's a great approach for this, even though if they are in the Meckel's cave and the posterior fossa. And there are some other tumors, as it has been shown here previously, that where we can use it as a the middle fossa as a corridor to expose tumors, uh, like this complex tumor. This is a clival meningioma, that it's uh, it was a part of a, 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 a complex discussion in order to see what was the best approach. We decided and analyzed all the different corridors, and we decided that uh, we were seeing that this tumor was originating from the clivus. And since the clivus is the origin, we know that all the uh, neurovascular structures that are going to be related with this tumor. But uh, according to what we previously see, uh, saw in the previous uh, presentations, I don't think that, for example, a retrosigmoid approach would be, uh, would be suitable for this case. Why? because this tumor comes from the clivus. And this is, for example, the view of my thought that I would see from a retro sigmoid approach. We would see the, the fifth nerve, the seventh, eight, and the lower cranial nerves. And so we would be working through the cranial nerves. And so this is the reason I decided to go in a combined petrosal approach because I was going to work uh, through the trigeminal nerve and not through the seven, eight complex. What we do is that we do this, uh, this approach with this combined approach. We combined the middle fossa with the, with the combined posterior fossa. And at this moment, we, are, uh, we do the, the, the craniotomy. And we, in this case, we did it uh, obviously in, in two steps. We do, as I mentioned previously, we place a, a extra ventricular shunt here in the, directly to the atrium. And so this will allow us to have this uh, in our surgical field, the, the, the drainage of CSF. That's what we found, find better than the lumbar drainage because it's gonna allow us to have a controlled uh, uh, CSF manipulation. In this case, as I previously mentioned, in this case, I thought it was too big. So I went all the way to from the anterior clinal process to dissecting the complete middle fossa. I'm going to go a little faster for the sake of time. And here we have exposed the complete middle fossa. We, it's very important to expose the impressional, the trigeminal impression as we previously saw by, by some other for, for, of our expositors. And we do uh, anterior petrosal drilling in order to expose all the anterior, uh, to, to drill all the Kawasis triangle. And it's very important to take the most advantage that you can from this, from this drilling. So there we're going to continue with the, with the drilling. And after, I'm sorry, after the drilling, we do the of the anterior petrus. We do we combine it with a posterior uh, petrosal approach, and going back to the middle fossa, it's very important to uh, uh, this in order to drill all the petrus apex to expose completely the trigeminal nerve and to dissect the petrus apex uh, in order to try to visualize the, six, the sixth cranial nerve. It's gonna be full of tumor. This is the free edge of the tentorium. Always check above and below in order to see if we have the fourth cranial nerve that according to our thought of the growth pattern of this tumor, we know that this tumor is going to be, that the nerve is going to be uh, uh, displaced. And as we can see here, we can see the fourth cranial nerve. It is very important to try to, 
and here the attachment of the tumor is very, very adherent to the tumor, to the nerve. So it's complicated to, to, to completely preserve. We can work above the, the fourth cranial nerve and below between the, the trigeminal nerve and the fourth cranial nerve. I'm going to go a little faster. As we can see here, we have a, a corridor that it's going to be uh, between these nerves. Here we can see the trigeminal nerve that it's completely exposed. And what I like about this approach is that you can work in different uh, uh, corridors mobilizing this trigeminal nerve. So this is going to allow us to dissect freely, as we can see here, to mobilize the nerve and to decompress. This patient, um, she was uh, 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 asymptomatic, believe it or not, according to the, to, the, to the growth, to the giant size of the tumor. And so it's very important to take care of, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. And so here we are debulking the tumor. It's kind of slow, I'm sorry. Here we are debulking the tumor, as we can see. And the important thing about, I'm sorry, it's, it's, I think that the video is slowing up, but curious. And the important thing is that through this corridor, we can see here how the fourth cranial nerve is completely adherent to the, to the tumor. So it's a very difficult, uh, very difficult um, dissection. And here we try to preserve it, but unfortunately, as we can see here, it's, it's, it's very, very adherent, which in my thought, I don't know if from coming from retrosig, this, this would be very, very difficult to, to, to manipulate. I'm sorry. And so in this case, we, we lost the, the continuity of this, of this nerve and we decided to save it here in order to, to do a, a, a reconstruction. And now we have a huge gigantic corridor that is gonna allow us between the, the trigeminal and the third cranial nerve, a gigantic corridor in order to remove this term. We continue with the debulking as we always preserve the arachnoidal uh, uh, membranes. It's, it's very important that it was previously mentioned. There we can see the, the third cranial nerve. Okay. I'm sorry. And we later uh, reviewed the, 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 from the posterior, we mainly use this anterior middle fossa corridor. And as we saw, the seven and eighth cranial nerves are in the way of the dissection. So we found that it wasn't, we didn't find uh, a lot of space in order to work from there. And so we used mostly the anterior petrosal uh, region. So this is the part of the tumor that was removed. This is the trigeminal nerve that it's, it's completely, it's the suture of the, of the fourth cranial nerve at the end of the, of the surgery. And this is the final view. And as I showed, this is the pre-op, the post-op. This is the pre-op, the post-op, and the patient uh, in the post-operative without a, a facial palsy, she improved. And she also, uh, this is a three month 
follow-up of her fourth cranial nerve, uh, which, which was uh, improving, but not 100%. This is some other kind of tumors, uh, also in the petroclival, true petroclival tumors, where we do the same incision, we place over here the external ventricular drainage in order to have it in our surgical field. We do this type of combined, uh, combined approach. We do the drilling uh, to expose the semicircular canals. We combine the anterior petrosal with the posterior, posterior petrosal. And later on, we open the tentorium uh, in order to the free edge of the tentorium, expose the complete trigeminal nerve, expose the tumor which is medial to the trigeminal nerve, and debulk the tumor in order to have a wide exposure. This is the vascular artery shown here. And this is the sixth cranial nerve here. Uh, and the final fourth cranial nerve, which was also very adherent, but it was, it was preserved. At the end, as we mentioned, as it was mentioned previously, we used this pedicle flap in order to reconstruct the, the skull base. And this is the post-operative control. Uh, of the of the, the immediate post-operative, the patient has a sixth cranial nerve, which was uh, uh, preserved. And so this is a recent case. So we are hoping that we have improvement of this nerve since it was preserved. And the final case, which I want to show that also this, this middle fossa is a corridor to expose the infratemporal fossa. For example, this tumor, which is in the infratemporal fossa, and the pterygoid palatine fossa uh, of this patient, as we can see in this, in this MRI, this, thing, this tumor was really calcified. And so we do the same approach as it was mentioned previously. I'm going to go a little bit faster for the sake of time. And we do, as it was mentioned, we do a drill, we do an exposure of the middle fossa, open the, uh, the, the the orbitomeningeal uh, band and expose here the infratemporal fossa. And so also the middle fossa is a corridor that we can use in order to, uh, to, to access the infratemporal fossa from its roof. So this tumor was really, as I mentioned, uh, calcified. So we do uh, the drilling also of, of, of the tumor. And uh, as you can see here, we are removing the tumor from the infratemporal fossa. It's very important to preserve the anatomy. And uh, here we can see the pterygoid the muscles going through the roof of the infratemporal fossa. Uh, we're going to have this exposure uh, down here from the, from uh, there we are opening later on the orbitomeningeal band in order to completely expose the infratemporal fossa. And in here, we can see the complete projection of B2 and also the Vivian, the projection of the Vivian nerve. And down here, we're going to have the posterior part of the maxillary, of the maxillary, the pterygopalatine fossa and the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. So this is an exposure, this is going to be B3. And, the, and this is the resection, which is a, a fair resection, always uh, preserving here a little bit of tumor, but uh, avoiding the CSF leak. This is the pre-op, this is the post-op, and the, the patient in the follow-up. So at the end, I find that the middle fossa approaches is an extremely tool it's a, a, in the armamentarium of all neurosurgeons. This middle fossa approach, it's mainly a, a corridor. It's not only tumors in, sitting in the middle fossa, but it's, we can use it in, as a corridor in order to get very close to the pathology, like in the petroclival region, which is going to improve our movements and our dissections. Um, it allows us to access pathology nearly everywhere, anterior, middle, and posterior, and infratemporal fossa. And 
intradural and extradural pathology. This can be done only if you work in the lab. And so we're going to have a, even though uh, we're going to have a, a skull base uh, on the middle fossa lab in May 3, 13 to 16, uh, people can register here. We are using all the, uh, all the uh, social distancing measures and people with that have been vaccinated. And this is going to be our follow our next course. And I would like to, to thank you everybody and thank you for listening. Sorry for the technical difficulties and hopefully next time we can be uh, in, in person in, in Egypt, which I've never been. Thank you. Diego, that was absolutely spectacular. I actually, I sent you a private message to tell you because I have to start another Zoom in eight minutes. I wasn't sure if uh, you're gonna finish before I have to leave, but that was really spectacular. The, I, I don't know if the young people are, are appreciating the anatomy, the way you exposed it well, and the importance of, as you said, uh, dissecting in the lab. Can I ask you of all the approaches, just a kind of general question that uh, <clears throat> you have done, which one do you think it takes the longest to learn even after you become a neurosurgeon and you finish your training? Do, do you know what I'm saying? Do, do you understand yes. my question? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Dax. Uh, every time for me, it's very important to, to listen the, the, the comments from Dr. Benis and, and from Dr. Morcos. And I studied your papers, uh, Jax, from, from, the post, from the Petrus bone and, and its classifications. And for me, it's very important that as, pan, as time goes by, I'm using more regularly the combined petrosal approach. I think that uh, when it's done, like in a directed to the type to the to each patient to tailored to each case it, it it's not as long as it's usually done we do it uh, the, we do the posterior petrosal approach ourselves in neurosurgery without uh, in, without the, the otologist and so uh, i'm using very much the the, the combined petrosal because i find that this relationship with the trigeminal nerve and manipulating the trigeminal nerve, I I'd rather have that than try than manipulate the the the, the other the, the facial nerve or the lower cranial nerves, which will have a, a, a worse uh, postoperative uh, outcome. So uh, for me, that's the gold the gold uh, part of the, of this approach that I find that manipulating the trigeminal nerve, the the patient is going to to have a, a better outcome. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree. I also use it quite a bit uh, when it's a lesion in the middle and posterior fossa. And I think it has had a bad reputation because of the vein of Labé injury when people did not know how to handle properly dural opening or were not realizing in the specific case where there are venous anomalies and cutting the tentorium ending up with venous issues or they putting self-retaining retractor without lumbar drainage and hammering the temporal lobe. But I agree with you. I, I, when I do them, I mean, there is no self-retaining retractor because you lose lumbar drain and the exposure is centered on the tentorium. Let me open it up to, to the panelists, the audience. I'm checking the chat box. Uh, people saying that it's superb lecture and stuff like that. Uh, Anybody has any questions? No questions. Just to congratulate to my colleague from Mexico City also. Uh, uh, good lecture and very nice cases, uh, colleague Diego Mendez. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Dr. Victor. Thank you very much. Vlad, any comments? Uh, I, I loved that. Diego, that was really, really excellent. The, 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 the cases were amazing, especially the midline clival tumor that, that's uh, rarely seen and the approach is perfect. And what I admired most, of course, was your stress on arachnoid. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I really admire your work. Thank you.
Set, congrats, set. Diego. Congrats. Beautiful, beautiful case. Excellent technique. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. Thank you. Jean, is this a new a new look? Are you trying to be like Diego with the goatee? Is this what you're trying to do? You know? Yes, yeah, so I'm getting old, you know, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it's not gonna be as elegant as his, you know. His is a full beard <laughs> thing, so <laughs> thank you. Well, Sameh, I give it back to you to conclude the whole thing, or what else would you like to do? Thank, thank you, uh, Jay Brooks, uh, the mentors. Uh, it was a great pleasure to be with you uh, this uh, night. I admire everyone accepting our invitation and help us to make our celebration so bubbly. Thank you all and meet you again. Thank you. Okay, we'll Thank wrap you. it up. We'll wrap, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. See you. Great. Congratulations. Take care, Vlad. Take care, Jack. Thank you.